cryptocurrency cryptocurrency is a very popular these days as you may heard about bitcoins the most expensive currency in the world in order to understand cryptocurrency words first let's discuss how digital cash works so digital cash started 30 years ago somewhere in 1990 person who gave the birth to digital form of currency so what we call cash actually for cash are they with you this dream to create a currency which gives the people kind of democracy he wants to have a currency in electronic form where nobody controls it. in order to be success his dreams he has created something called digital cash he designed this digital cash based on the concept that we call it as blind signatures this digital cash supports anonymity as regular hard currencies so for that they use a concept of blind signatures the objective of this session today is to discuss that or to discuss cryptocurrencies anonymity is one of the main requirement in the crypto currency or whatever the digital cash there is a difference between these two i will take an example in a minute the concept of blind signatures discuss signing some document without having a look of the content without having or without reading the content so you might ask are they the people are they or oh, people doing it whether they like to do it because everybody before signing would like to see the country but the chun developed very interesting protocol so it has certain choose protocols that let or enable anybody to sign in the documents without looking at it it is probabilistic based protocol so using this protocol for it as ventures banks issues those currencies without checking the unique id and the value on those notes so because of that banks or no one else will be able to trace people who owns those coins so to best develop scheme for that it's called digi cash and was introduced somewhere in 90s it's purely provide anonymous and it's kind of secure it not it's not possible to do double spending and it can transfer from one side to the other side but that system was bankrupted in 1999 20 years ago so why i mentioned this system before we discuss cryptocurrencies because chum highlighted the features which any currency require so if you want to have a currency equivalent for the way equivalent to physical cash it should be anonymous because when you pay by cash we cannot link our payment to the type of things we purchase it's totally anonymous then it should require security which specially call it as it should stop ever spending what we call it as multiple spending why in anything in electronic form so people can make copies
if let's say I have some coin, so I can use that coin to pay multiple merchants because all the coins basically say. But in the physical currency, you know, when you pay by a coin, that goes to the merchant. So I don't have it. But it is in the electronic form, I can make a copy and then I can pay to multiple parties. So, anyone who wants to have a digital form of payment need to think about how to stop such double spending and how to stop, how to provide anonymity, how to stop double, double spending and how to stop, how to provide anonymity in the transactions. So Chum's mechanism, DigiCash, perfectly achieve these two objectives. However, Chum's sticky cash is matched with the existing currencies like US dollar, Euro, or rupees. So Chum cannot generate money in his digital cash systems. Instead of, he basically issue equivalent amount of the currencies. If there is a one dollar, you can pay one dollar to a bank and bank can issue one dollar equal point. If you pay one rupee to the bank, bank issue one rupee equal point to the person who paid. So there is no money generation in the system. The system has the method of storing and transfer from sender to the recipient. Since it's in electronic form, this transfer is online. Immediately can do. No one can double spend. It is anonymous, but it was bankrupt. What was the reason for that? I'll discuss that in a minute. So after two, or kind of same time, same age. So three big credit card companies, Europe, MasterCard, and Visa, create a method of storing such digital currencies on their credit cards or the debit card itself. So they have created a smart card format, but they call it as EMB. So this EMB chip supports the method of storing a digital wallet on a chip. So EMB standard is still valid. So they have now, you, you, you may experience like touch and go payments. So using NFC technology. So this touch and go with NFC use EMB chips. So the EMB chips can store some numbers actually. So they are really not currency, so the coins. So they are just some numbers. So in addition to the EMB and NFC, we could use regular phones to store those currencies if you if we can generate. So the software or the hardware which usually store those currencies is called as digital wallets. So those digital wallets may support different kinds of currencies. And nowadays we can see hardware digital wallets online digital wallets where you don't have physical rewards if you are virtually store it somewhere in a website. That is really dangerous. We discussed towards the end. So in principle, digital wallets are the software or hardware which can store digital money or the money in the digital form. As I mentioned, the first effort, first try, which given by Chun to establish a digital cash was failed 20 years ago because for single reason, that is central point of control. So this system need to trust a big guy that that is bad. The bank in order to access Chum's system, 
the banks in the world should support that system. Unfortunately, the banks and the central banks in the Congress, they didn't like this system. They don't like this system. As you know, even after 20 years, they still like to issue currencies. So issuing currencies costs a heavy. So sometimes maybe issuing two rupee, coin may take five rupee. Cost for creating this two rupee coin, perhaps maybe worth of five rupee. So there is a cost. But they're issuing hard currencies. They don't like having electronic currencies, electronic form of currencies. So when you say electronic form of currencies, we can identify nowadays two types of electronic forms of currencies. So, so far we discussed digital cash. Digital cash is the equivalent version of real cash. So we can issue a digital cash equivalent to the rupees, equivalent to the dollars, and so on. So those schemes cannot generate currencies. They basically issue a token which is equivalent to a physical currency. Chum has such, had such system. So it didn't work, as I said, but it had anonymity. It, it stopped double spending, but it failed. So like 10 years ago, some anonymous person, we don't know who, who he is, created a scheme different to this digital cash. So he created what he called as digital currency. The digital currency is entirely new currency like US dollar. So this currency is not owned by anybody. This currency is not controlled by anybody. It is an entirely new currency independent of central controls. So such was currency is called as Bitcoin. So when people realize the very interesting concept behind Bitcoin, Everybody was excited. So then people start creating different kind of such digital currency schemes. Nowadays, there are hundreds of digital currencies available like physical currencies. So called Bitcoins, Ethereum, Monero coins, and so on, so many. So those are digital currencies, not the digital cash. I repeat. The difference? Digital cash always equivalent to the real cash, and digital cash is not generated. It's basically derived from the real cash, store and transfer. Digital currencies are new currency schemes, and these currencies independently exist without any central control. That is really interesting. So for such, for, for such currencies for me has Bitcoin. So as I mentioned, after variance of digital cash, there were several proposals to having such schemes. But people realize there is no advantage of having such schemes until someone controls them. So who are the people who control currencies in the world? The banks and the central banks. So in order to use such currencies, those banks must be trusted. And these banks have so many regulations and and politicians in, the, in whatever the relevant countries controls issuing those currencies and the value of those currencies and so on. They are not independent. So people are looking for such independent currency. 
So finally, we found it. First such digital currency that called as Bitcoin. Digital cash such as Chungzwan and all other schemes kind of now disappear. So digital cash define we define the digital cash as an electronic version of existing currency. Digital currencies you payments instrument. Digital currencies are new payment instruments like dollars. Now we have bitcoins, we have Ethereum. So they are new payments instruments where we can use them to buy, sell, whatever we do online. So in general, those digital currencies the digital currencies are called as cryptocurrencies because we are using cryptography to create those currencies. So those cryptocurrencies should support anonymity and it should stop double spending and should support offline plus online transaction and should be able to transfer in between people in anywhere in the world. And also such, uh, it, it is a currency, we need to be subdivided. And we should be able to, as I said, we should be able to transfer through the wire or the air. So can we develop such currency? where there are no physical proof, can transfer through any medium, it's anonymous, support any online or offline transfer, and can be subdivided, very interesting. How can we have to subdivide it, this is currency. So if we give, if you want to buy six rupee thing, can you give 10 rupees, I need to be able to get for rupee change, right? Can we do that? Can we develop such system? Yes, we can. So someone called Nakimoto shows how to do that in kind of 12 years ago. Some people say Nakimoto is an indi in individual, individual cryptographer. Some people say it's an organization. Some people kind of think that is a, some government behind that scheme. Nakimoto is a government in, in, in the world. But still we don't know who Nakimoto is. We are not interested to, inter, interesting to find this person as well. Personally, I'm not interested, but I'm interested to learn <coughs> and study how it works. I think you also the same. So all the cryptocurrencies works in similar manner, with, but they use different cryptographic algorithms, techniques, and methods. But in principle, the behind all these cryptocurrencies are the same. They, all currencies, are the method of creation or the generation of these currencies. And they have method of securely transferring these currencies over the wire wireless, electronically. They usually have method of protection against double spending or multiple spending. And anyone can work as a merchant or the customer because I can sell anything or I, because I can buy anything from the currency similarly, he can do that. And it provides anonymity. So when you come to anonymity, there are two types of anonymity we can see. It's a real pure anonymity or a pseudo anonymity. Pseudo anonymity refers to if we create a Real identity when you're creating digital coins, 
So then we may invoke the free anonymity. So pseudo anonymity refers to getting anonymity by hiding our identity. So I can create an account, for example, with someone else's name. Then I use pseudo anonymous account. If I create an account with my real name, so let's say email account with my real name, then that account is not anonymous. I can create an account maybe using someone some some bogus name. Then I have an account. Email account, so then you see email account similarly. So nothing interesting going so then it's not real anonymous. Fine. So a little bit of history. So as I mentioned, 2008, the scheme was published. Nobody interested. In 2009, he has kind of issuing those currencies called Bitcoin and start using in between a small group. Some people in that group is actually really, if we know who are they, some people we don't know who are they, but anyway, we don't know who, who is talking about. So that group of people in the world started using it in 2009, 2011. It's a very small group, nobody interests on that. Somewhere around 2011 to 2013, some bad guy in the internet, what he called computer underworld or darknet, identified the beauty of digital currency. Before the good people, usually bad guys will spot the technology is faster than good people. That's why a lot of cyber crimes happens in the world. So good guys think that works and they don't interest new technologies and the methods until someone has been. So anyway, the person who runs Underworld website, or it has Silk Road, has a serious problem. So in the Silk Road, that part person was selling drugs, weapons, and so many bad things. And he don't have proper way of getting the payment. Why? Because if we use credit card to get the payment, police knows who paid. And police may not be able to perhaps catch one of the sales road, but very clearly see who the person who bought it. So he could not ask, like the owner could not ask to transfer those monies in the bank account. So then all bank accounts as ID, identity, and then police trust the owner, trust the person who paid. So, that person was running on the world website with huge difficulty of getting the pain. So he noticed that there was a very nice scheme called cryptocurrency Bitcoin. They are provide the pseudonymity. So can't I accept this payment with Bitcoin? So after he see the advantage of those cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, before the good people. So what he did, he announced in his underworld website saying he would accept the payment only via Bitcoin. He said, I will give you uh, drugs if you pay me 10 Bitcoins. I will give you a pistol if you give me 100 Bitcoin. So the people who wants to buy those, then was searching about what is this Bitcoin? And he realized there are small group exchanging some electronic bits here and there, and they call them as Bitcoins. And they, they claim they have such number of Bitcoins and so on. 
So then the demand starts. So what happened? The people who want to buy bad kind of people who want to buy the things from the Silk Road underground website wants to buy the bitcoins from this small group who is handling these bitcoins. So then these groups start selling the bitcoin they have initially one bitcoin for one dollar. So since that demand started because of the Silk Road and due to followed by so many other ransomware and the other bad guys. So there was a huge demand started in the computer underground for the Bitcoin. So $1 Bitcoin price went to $20,000 for one Bitcoin. The price of the Bitcoin was skyrocket due to the demand. So when it's going up the demand, this bad guy is collecting the Bitcoin. People who want to buy the Bitcoin, basically buying it initially from the owners or who, who, who basically initially created. So then that Bitcoin is transferred to the bad guys. So when the demand started, bad guys started selling the Bitcoins where he has for the higher prices. So kind of you see the economic cycle behind that. So anyway, now we want to see how it works. The concepts, theory behind it. I'll show you using, I'll guide you step by step and show you how this Bitcoin works from the scratch to the real. So I name that. So for that, I, 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 I'm also interested. Let's say I would like to, I myself want to create a new currency system. I name that currency at Bitkasi. Assume my name is Bitkasi. People who use it, kind of my network, we call Bitkasi currency network. The capital they represent the currency type like like rupees. Now I, I have my own currency scheme called Bitkasi and that scheme exchange through a network called Bitkasi. Right. So my first version of this new currency scheme is very simple. So in there I said so I would like to kind of, yeah, I said, parties who wants to use this currency should have public private key pairs. Those who knows cryptography knows about what is public private keys. So it's called as asymmetric key cryptography. So usually the owners keep the private key and publish their public keys. Using the private keys, owners can digitally signs the messages, then using the corresponding public key, others can verify those messages. So in initially, let's say in this my Bitkasi scheme, there are two people. So me and my one of my friend called Charles. So we want to have our own currency scheme. So what I said, Chamatle here, here we do our own currency scheme. This is very simple. I will just send you a message saying, I am person, want to transfer one big currency to you. So I will digitally sign and send it to you. So you can get my public key and verify the signature of this message. If that signature is correct, you know, so it's really from me. Then also you know, I am willing to give one bit class to you. So you can accept. So you might ask why, is, why he accepted such messages. That's a different story, but 
So we could do that's kind of a transaction. Signature verification creates verifies whether this message from me to Chamat or Chamat to me or someone else like that. Everybody should, should digitally sign in this key the messages they pass in between. So after I digitally sign and send and Chamath hold this message, by showing his message, he can claim Kasun has sent one bit Kasi to him. So then he can claim he have one bit Kasi. So similarly, he can also create a message and sends me saying he is transferred two bit Kasi to me. So I can save this message in my digital wallet or in some software and show someone saying, here I am having two bit cards, which sends by someone. And maybe from that two bit cards, I can send one bit cards to someone else. Someone else who believes Chamath and me can get it as the correct cards. But if you ended up with this such scheme, you see these schemes are really incomplete because with such scheme anyone can create any amount of currencies so there are no controls of generating currencies then we may not be able to get the account the account balance because we don't know how many currencies i have maybe i have received currencies from different people i send them some parts some parts i have in it no proper mechanism would count in that. And there are no proper, me proper mechanism to stop double spend. Because I can send same currency to Kalhamad and someone else. So no one will be able to see whether I'm sending the same or different. So really incomplete, in incomplete system. So I want to improve that with some by applying some mechanism. There, what I do here, I introduce some random number. You know, every currency has a serial number. Even hot currency has a serial number. So in order to then, to kind of uniquely identify currencies I issue, I might assign a serial number. So that is something, some random number. So then I say I'm Kasun send, sending this bit cars with that serial number to Chama and digitally sign. So when Chama shows that serial number, the others knows it is a unique message because I am sending different payments to Chama. I have, I have to use different serial number. So those serial numbers are uniquely represent those classes. So then the rest of the people can identify. So they are not duplicate. That I am not teaching. If, some, if I try to duplicate, I use same number to pay someone else. So then people see, okay, I'm really cheating. Duplicate. But if I use such serial number in each currency, so I am facing an issue. Who is going to create the serial number? So everybody in the world start creating such currencies with unique serial numbers. There should be some one issue in the serial numbers, otherwise, definitely those numbers start duplicating. So then we need to have some central authority issuing these serial numbers. So I don't want to do so because I want to have a scheme independent of banks or independent of central authorities. So I want to create those numbers without having such trusted parties such as banks. Can I do that? So I am introducing new method to do that. 
I want to then, I create a new method. All it has blockchain to do that. Stop double spending. So this my new concept called blockchain eliminate need of central point of trust. So using the blockchain, we can find it out my account balance is it. What is this blockchain? Blockchain is an open distributed ledger. Actually, not distributed, open, decentralized, kind of, or distributed. Better way is distributed ledger. The correct name is distributed ledger. Then you know what ledgers has? Ledgers has sequence of transactions. So if we do transaction even in the banks, they write it into the ledger. Nowadays, they actually write it into a transaction in this database. So banks identify those transactions using the database entries in the transaction table. Similarly, I want to keep an open public ledger or the transaction table. So when I send a digitally signed message to Chamat saying, here I am cousin, transferring one bit Kazi to you with this serial number. So that will write it to this ledger, public ledger. So then I say, I transfer two bitcoins to Nimal with the serial number. That also then write it into this ledger. So then Chama can transfer from one Bitcoin he received from me to maybe someone else. So then Chamat can say, I'm transferring one Bitcoin received from Kasun to Nimu. So that also write it into the ledger. So then when Niman received that, Niman can check the ledger and see whether actually Chamat received one Bitcoin from me. So then he can see the entry. So also he can see Kasun has not duplicated this number. Plus, he can see in the ledger that from the one which Kasi Chamat Rezu is transferring that to me. So then he will see the transaction path. So in other words, when someone get uh, such message in my scheme, before he accepting that, he has to check whether that number or that Kazi has used before or not. Otherwise, the person who sent in the message can double spend. In order to stop double spending, when someone receives a transaction from me or someone else, he has to check whether so I have I am reusing it or not. So or, or else he has to check whether it is unique transaction. So if you have such central ledger to write such transaction, and as I mentioned, before accepting these currencies or the messages, they can check the ledger to see whether it used before. However, still someone can do cheating. So how? We can send the same message or same passy to multiple people at the same time. So then that initial one may still not appear on the ledger at the time the other people are checking it. So then after they accepting and then 
they check the ledger, they realize, okay, he has spent it multiple times. He was cheating. So then, having a central ledger will create an issue when we do millions of concurrent such transactions. There might be a message still not appear in the ledger, but he is on the way of verification. So then we have an issue, let's say at the same time two person receive a transaction. So whether the first one is valid or the second one is valid because they simultaneously receive it, they might fight each other. I receive first, so I need that and so on. So because everything should be automatic and there are no central control. So if you have a central ledger storing such transactions, may not work as you may see in case of simultaneous messages. So maybe in order to solve that, person who receiving such bitcoins, let's say Chaman, can do simple things. So for example, let's say I send a transaction to Chaman, so and I write that to the ledger. If Chaman check the ledger and accept it, it's kind of an issue, as I explained. Instead, Chaman can ask people who are using that in the network, everybody, saying whether Kasun has sent this before. Or in other words, Chama can ask for people who are using this scheme whether this Bitkasi he received is a valid cast. So if it is reused, it is not a valid one. So in order to understand the validity, as I said, he should ask everybody in the network. But if you have such open distributed payment scheme, we don't know how many people participate in. So then we don't know how many people we should ask. So if we want to find it out how many people participate in the network, again, we need to have some central server storing number of people who participate in, in this scheme. So we don't want to have central storage. So we need to have some solution for that. So how about this solution? So in, in my scheme I propose, so I send the transaction, digitally signed message with some unique ID. I store it in a ledger where everybody can see. Same time, everybody, everybody using that can keep the same ledger. So my transaction duplicate to the, all the ledgers in the world. So then someone else using sending such transaction will write that transaction in this ledger plus all the ledgers in the world. So those ledgers distribute those transactions or exchange those transactions at real time. So if you do so, it's called as distributed or decentralized, distributed and decentralized ledger. So that ledger is called as blockchain. So there are some other properties I can't find. So we, I use still ledger. So then in my scheme, I have introduced distributed ledger. People who are using this my currency scheme has, everybody has such ledger maintained, and everybody else can access this ledger. So then when I send a transaction, I write an entry to this ledger, and that entry is distributed all such ledgers in the world. So then I, Let's say I receive such transaction or my transaction received by Chamath. Before accepting that, Chamath has to check whether I have spent this coin before or not. So that for that, Chamath has to ask his own ledgers, one of those ledgers, whether that transaction appears their ledgers before. So as I mentioned, 
if I know the number of people who are using this team, so I can perhaps wait for majority vote or answers from majority of the people. So let's say 100 people in the network. If 51 says this is this transaction is not that year, the most probably this we can accept the answers. If I don't know how many people, then I, I have an issue. How long I should wait for the answers? Similarly, if I answer such question, saying I receive one Bitcoin, do you have duplicate or do you see that in your ledgers or not from the other people? There should be some incentive for them to answer that question. Because I am the person who received Bitcoin. So are there any other people who help me? Why they won't help me? So you see, still it is kind of uncertain. So in order to solve that issue, I created nice team, let's say. This is what I call it as proof of work. Proof of work. So in this proof of work scheme, what, we, what happens? I send a transaction like sign message to Shamat. Shamat asks the network whether this is used before. In other words, Shamas are the validity of this case. There are no central authority to ask such. He asks everyone in the network. So then, people in the network must respond to that with some evidence of proof of work. So everybody in the network just responds to that, say yes or no to my Chamat question. So someone will say yes, yes. Or someone who against me may say no. So I want to stop that as well. In other words, I want to kind of trusted answer from the network. How can I get that? So the method we introduced to get that is called as proof of work. In the proof of work, says someone before giving an answer has, has to show he has done some amount of work to prove he has a trusted person. So one of the very simple proof of work challenge is a hashing function. So who knows cryptography may knows about what is hashing. The hashing is the algorithm where we put a message x to that, it creates a short code called hash. So we may not be able to find two values for x0 and x which create the same hash in real time. So that's how hashing algorithm works. Hash considers nice proof of work algorithm because if someone give a number and a hash value, we can fast, we can verify it fast whether that hash actually created this number. So in order to have proof of work, we need to have a problem. It is difficult to solve. So then if someone solve it, we know he has spent some time to solve it, to, he, then he demonstrate his proof of work. And we need to have simple method to verify. In other words, we should have a problem difficult to solve, simple to verify. And then we need to be kind of increase the scale in it, the difficulty of difficulty we need to be improved with the time because you know computer time, computer power increase day by day. The problem is difficult to solve today, may not be difficult to solve tomorrow with fast computing. So the problem should have scalable difficulty. So 
the in order to use the problem in to apply into the paper flow we need to have problem difficult to solve easy to verify and scalable so such as i mentioned such problem is the hashing hashing is easy to calculate or easy to verify and can some by changing the hash length and so on like that it can kind of improve this difficult but we need to have a problem difficult to solve but hash is easy to verify but easy to solve as well so then we have to convert the hashing into a problem to difficult to solve so there is a simple way we can create such problem so there we say you have to generate a hash with some pattern so if someone want to do that as long as no no algorithm of doing that then they has to do it by an error so for example let's say i custom transfer because of this number to chama and chama crazy so i should ask the letter whether the person is used this before so the network should respond with some number which chamat can verify verify chamat can it the number which someone can verify so by verifying the number chamat should be able to understand person who provide this answer has spent a quite lot of a quite amount of time to view create in this number because of that chamat can assume or believe that person who answer is a trusted person because he has spent this amount of money to create this he is a good guy otherwise he might not spend this amount of money to kind of provide him at this answer So you will question on my statement. So hold on, you will get answer later on. Anyway, so in this scheme, then what I do, I am uh, uh, in this scheme. Then Chamath asks the question. So then I say, anyone who wants to provide the answer to that Chamath question has to generate a random number called K. So then that K add to this message to transaction. should create a hash which less than the threshold t so i have a threshold value t so then he should the scheme or person who answer should kind of creating a hash value which less than t so then the person can respond to the chamat answer with that k saying this transaction is valid so when chamat receive that k he can add his message h to that and get the hash and t see whether it's less than the threshold c t then he knows chamat knows okay that this person has spent quite a quite a lot of amount of time to find this k because in order to create a hash less than some threshold it's not a straight for algorithm so someone has to randomly try with millions of cases to find such k which creating some hash value which less than t with that message eh? so this k is the same so so someone who find the k should respond to chamat <laughs> so this k is chosen randomly and after chamat kind of try to receive in that k or this this k can write a entry to the ledger this transaction is valid so then everyone see that 
So everyone realized that person, let's say, Nima verifies this. Or Nima tells this, this transaction is valid. He has spent quite amount of time to find the key which says that and so on. So if you want to kind of creating case for each and every transaction, you know, it's a huge amount of work. Because of that, so we, we kind of generalize this system saying, so everybody send transactions, so everybody see these transactions, no one should ask whether this is valid or not. Instead, so everybody see a set of transactions, so we can accumulate this set into one block and then try to find the K with all those messages. So then they say, okay, though all those messages are unique, here is the K to, I spend this quite amount of time to find that K in order to say this set of messages well. So then that is verify or validate a block of transaction. And then this block of transaction right into our legends. So how to create a block? There are a set of transactions and we find the K with getting all the hashes, add the K to that. So that K should be kind of less than T. So if so, so I can provide the answer saying all this block is valid if I find such key to verify those all transactions. After verifying those all transactions, if I find such key, I can announce that by writing that block to the ledger. I think you still don't understand that. So let's see. Let's summarize what we discussed. So I am Kazun. Want to send a transaction to Chamath. I create a message saying I am Kasun transferring one bit parcel to Chamath, digitally signed with my private key, and says to Chamath. When Chamath receives this, Chamath doesn't know I have reused this coin or not. Chamath doesn't know this coin is valid or this has a valid serial number or not. Because of that, he has the network. He has the people in the network whether the transaction he received is valid. So when that transaction number received to those networks, network start generating the K which I said. So network has to provide the answer. Before that, the network has to show they have spent some time to give this answer. So then he has to find the transaction plus some K. So they are calculating and try to find such k. So suddenly this guy has found the k. So then he distributes that k to the network saying, okay, I found that k. So, and I, I would like to announce the transaction is valid. So everybody see whether add that k to this transaction and see whether this hash is less than t. Then he, they, everybody realize he has actually done that and he is a genuine guy. So everybody accept this transaction as correct transaction and write those transactions into their ledgers. So, Chamath then trust, can trust the answer from Charlie, for example, if he is a Charlie, and then say he received one bit Kasi from me. Right. So as I mentioned, we cannot do it for, for each and every transaction. If you do, so it's a huge burden. Because of that, we accumulate a set of transactions and get a hash of it and add a nonce or whatever this random number k to generate this hash. Right. So we can do it for every kind of set of transactions accumulating over the period of some time. So if you do so, 
So we will have independent blocks, write it into the ledger with best known scheme. So in the later on, if you start doing that, if someone wants to cheat some transaction entry, let's say for example, there is a 7,000 transaction in the ledger, he, someone has to change it to maybe 7,000 7, to 7. Then what the party who want to cheat can do, take that block, change the entry, and find some key, and write it into the block. This, or insert it into that block, into the every ledger. So then the 70, maybe become 7,000, or maybe 70,000 can change to 7, any, anyone. Anyone can change any transaction, the matter of changing the block, allowing the block. So we have to stop that. Because everybody in the independently making those blocks or keeping those blocks. So if someone start cheating these entries in the blocks, we have to stop. So we should have mechanism to do that. Simple mechanism to do that is what we call it as chain, blockchain. So we know the blocks. Blocks is a set of transaction with some norms and the number of blocks. So now we need to keep that block in the chain. So there are what we do in this, we create an initial block, it may be a zero transaction or whatever. And whenever we create a block, next block, we insert a hash of the previous block into the next block. So for example, when you create a block 11, so block 11 is calculated with the hash of all the transactions and this k which I mentioned and time and block number and the previous hash of the blocks and that all should create this specific hash. So this specific block hash will use to create the next block and so on. So then hash of each block then depend on the previous hash. So in the first block has a zero previous hash. After the blocks, first block, usually first block called as genius block. After this genius block, all the other block use the previous hashes. So since it has multiple transactions in one block, we calculate the hash of those transactions using a method called Merkle hash. So in the Merkle hash, what we do, we these are the transactions. We take the hash of each transaction and then we get two hashes together, calculate the hash of that two hashes and then take the next two and calculate hashes of these two and get the hash and the, then take these two hashes, put them together and hash it like that. So we, starting from transaction, binarily we hash, take hash, hash of hashes, hash of hashes, till it reduced to a single hash. So this single hash is the hash of all these transactions. So then we take the hash of previous block of transaction and then need to find that nonce k. When we add this nonce k to all these transactions and the previous hash and the time and the block numbers, it should create a hash which less than some key. Until we get it that we have to randomly try this nonce or case. So if you create such sequence of block hashes, or what you call blockchains, so any individual guys try to cheat that it is very difficult to cheat. Why? So let's say this transaction want to alter with by some bad guys. So if he want to alter it, he has to change that. Then this hash will change, and all these root hash will change, change, and then he has to find the different nodes which match this validation. Let's say he find it. So after he find that, what's happened? So with that, all the later blocks get invalidated. Because of that, he has to alter norms of all the other blocks. That is practically not possible. Because these blocks are growing, if we change historical value in the block, and from history to right now with the 
present block, if someone try to change all that, he has to generate all quite a lot of nonce values. So I said it's difficult to creating one k. So if it is difficult then to create ten thousand k's, for example, before someone creating one more k. Theoretical. So then cheating the entries is difficult. So so this method I call it as blockchain. So people are creating such blocks independently. Because of that, sometimes this kind of branching might happen. So for example, so I create this block. So using hash of this block, I have created this. Same time, using the hash of this block, someone else may create a different block. With different k values. So then, people who see that someone else creating this block first, they create a next block using this hash as the previous hash. So maybe these people may not see someone has created this block because that might happen simultaneously, this too may happen because of that. So some group might see. It. The hash of this and they might create a block based on this hash. So then those groups may create a hash based on this previous hash and so on. So like that. So since there are no central controls and concurrency control here. So such branching might happen. So because of that I have introduced some concept, especially blockchain has introduced some concept saying if any of a chain lead six blocks than the other so the longest chains wins if these two people the people who are by the way people who are creating those blocks are called as minus why do they call it as minus because after creating these blocks, these protocols give them a reward. The reward is the same currency. So for example, if someone verifies, they want, so this person may not spend a quite a lot of time to verification if they don't get any advantage. So advantage for them to verify is Actually, if they create a, such a block by generating this random k, he, the network, given them some amount of money. So initially, Bitcoin network gives 50 Bitcoin for the people who create such block. So this is a reward. So people who create, created these blocks actually get to get those rewards. So, since they are finding this case, so the process of finding those cases is called as mining, cryptocurrency mining. So, people do cryptocurrency mining to earn money. Actually, this mining process is the process which generates the money. So, if you kind of find the case, you, you get a chance of inserting 50k. 50 and uh, 50 bitcoins to the network. So then that means you generated 50 bitcoin to the network. Okay, so the people who write in these logs are called as miners. If two miners branch and start generating, and one created uh, six blocks larger than the other, the longest miner or the longest path wins. All the trans all the other people has to drop that blocks. So that means if the transaction in those blocks are get invalidated and the transaction in those blocks are validated. So some of the transaction may in this part as well as that part, then there are no issues for such transactions. So as you may see, even after creating a block, there is a possibility to so there is a possibility that Turkey will abandon that block. Because of that, after we see our transaction appear in the block, we have to wait 
till the system created six more blocks. So because before six more blocks, there is a possibility at the middle people may abandon some blocks. So in this real blockchains which uses bitcoins, the count is six blocks. So in order to kind of creating six blocks, it takes roughly around 10 minutes. That means, so after I receive a transaction and see that transactions appears in my block or the blockchain or distributed ledger, I have to wait six more blocks to be created. So that usually takes 10 minutes. That means verification of Bitcoin and the cryptocurrency is not real time in this, especially for the Bitcoin network. So since every block uses a previous block hash, it gives the security of for the each block. As I, I mentioned, if someone wants to change a transaction in this, has to change that and change all the rest of the blocks, that is practically impossible because before he do that, if someone create the next block, he has to do change that block as well, like that. So it's practically not possible. So even I call them as Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin that's how Bitcoin works. So I have explained to you from the scratch new currency scheme for Bitcoin. So it's actually not a big cause it's Bitcoin. So in the Bitcoin works like that. If I summarize what we discussed in the how the Bitcoin works, Bitcoins are the messages passing between people saying there is a format of those messages. So these messages will pass in between people who use those uh, Bitcoins. And all those messages are digitally signed by the sender, the party who send in the money transaction. So after send that digitally signed messages, there are a set of people in the network called miners who verify those messages. So he has to check whether that message is previously used, whether the signature is correct and so on. So that is verification. Plus he has to show, this miner has to show, He's a good guy to that. He has to show he spent quite a lot of amount of time to give his verification. So that he has to find the K which I mentioned. So if some miner says this is a very valid transaction, the person who received that Bitcoin, my example, can accept that. But he has to wait until six blocks. <coughs> six blocks, six, usually one hour it says, maybe one block is kind of 10 minutes. I made a mistake in previous slides. One block, creating one block, average time right now is 10 minutes. So in the six blocks, it's that one hour. So after appearing my transaction in the block, I have to wait a one hour till next six blocks has created. So then after creating six blocks, after my block, I know no one can reverse it. It's impractical to reverse it. So new currency is created by giving rewards to the miners who verify in those transactions, or in other words, creating those blocks. All the transaction in the world will writing into the blocks, into the distributed ledger, so that blocks interconnected each other with the previous hashes. So that technology is called it as a blockchain. So Bitcoins are the concept of cryptocurrency introducing the concept of blockchain to the world. So in other words, cryptocurrency or the Bitcoin are one of the application of the blockchain. Blockchain has quite a lot of application. We will discuss maybe later on. All transactions should be in the blockchain. So anybody who uses the network will see all transactions transferred. 
So since all transactions should write into the blockchain, size of the blockchain is exponentially increasing. So individual people may not be able to maintain those blockchains because of that there are specific, special organizations or the companies started in the world to maintain those blockchains. So they call it as mines. They keep accumulating all transactions in the world. Right. So end users, like you and me, if we, if they, if we want to use blockchains, we should have a digital wallet. <laughs> so this is a kind of sample digital wallet of Bitcoin. So when you first time install this Bitcoin wallet, it creates public private key pair for this currency. And there are two ways of getting Bitcoin into my wallet. One method is I have to find such key and get the Bitcoin to my wallet as rewards. Right now, it is impossible to get to find such case. Before those miners finding it, it is impossible to find such case nowadays because miners having very powerful machines compared to the individuals. So the, if individuals want to get, get a Bitcoin into the, their wallet, the only methods right now is to buy it from the sellers. So miner sells it. Maybe someone else having already Bitcoin can sell it to you. So then you will get a Bitcoin into your wallet as a transaction. So when you have such thousands of wallets or millions of wallets in the world, we need to have a way of individually identify those wallets. So for that, we are using what we call Bitcoin address or cryptographic address. So based on different cryptocurrencies, method of creating this cryptographic address are different. So in the Bitcoins, so the way of creating address is like that. We take the private key of the wallet and calculate the RIP160 hash value for this private key. Private key is in the elliptical DC, DSA type of private key, Bitcoin users, and then RIP160 hash is created. So this hash value is binary in binary format because of that it converted into the readable format calling an algorithm base 58. So it created text value in the base 68 format. That is, we call it as a Bitcoin address. So that address is kind of a unique. So by giving this unique address to the people in the world, you can receive Bitcoins. So you can say, give me a if I want to sell this book, so give me one Bitcoin. So this is my address. So then people who are having Bitcoin can immediately transfer one Bitcoin from his wallet to your wallet to have this address. So it's not really going to his wallet software, your wallet software. It's actually what's happened. So the person who wants to pay insert a transaction into the distributed ledger saying one Bitcoin in his wallet address will transfer to the address of you. So it is kind of a digitally signed message inserted into this distributed ledger or what we call as blockchain, what we call as blockchain. So everybody see that and everybody can verify it. So later on, no one can deny it. It's transfer as well as acceptance. No one can deny that. So it's like the sending a digitally signed message. So, so since we are sending and receiving such electronically signed transactions, we need to have a mechanism to get the total or the comebacks. Bitcoin use a method called unspent transaction output methods to find it out the final balance associated with each address. So the people can very, uh, claim the ownership of the address using the signatures. So if you want to claim your funds, you should have your private key. So if someone else has taken your private key, he has taken all of your money. So that is the biggest disadvantage of this Bitcoin. 
in order to overcome that bitcoin nowadays what people do each bitcoin they keep different address so we may not keep a single public private key pair which associated with all my bitcoins is both i have multiple public private key pairs associated with each and every bitcoin so then someone has taken one of my private key so i lose only that bitcoin so if all my coins are associated with one key pair so if someone taken that key pair all my money will disappear most biggest bitcoin of the bitcoin is storing this money and kind of storing this money and kind of kind of exchanging uh, uh, kind of storing this money and protecting these keys how these transactions works and how this unspent kind of what we call unspent so it has unspent transaction output utx so unspent transaction output works is very interesting way. so for example let's say there is a person p1 who has a wallet he has received 50 bitcoin and 25 bitcoins p1 wants to give 60 bitcoins to a person called p2 someone has used 50 bitcoin to p1 someone has given 25 bitcoin to p1 so that means p1 have 75 bitcoins in the wallet at the moment so from uh, from this 75 he has to he wants to give 60 to a person called p2 so then what p1 has to do is he should announce a digitally signed transaction to the network saying i p1 gives 60 to p2 digitally signed by the keys associated with that code. <laughs> then after giving 60, he has 15 left. So he has to write a transaction with this to the network saying P1 gives 14 to the P1. So then one to the transaction P to the maybe to the mine. So some miners would like to receive a transaction P in addition to the rewards they are getting. So P1 says, I write 14 to P1 itself. So that is called unspent transaction output. So he write that. So then if we want to find out the balance of his wallet, we have to see the last transaction. So then we know, okay, P1 has 14 left in his wallet. So the ones which receives P2 then want to tra further transfer to P3. So let's say 42 to P3. So P2 can write, P2 can use 42 to P3. Then, then rest of the 17 bitcoins, then he has four, 18 left out of 60. From this 18, he can write 17 to itself and then one to the minor address. So he writes, this 17 to his address. So 42 to the P3 address. So looking at this transaction block, so everybody in the world see now P2 on 17. So 42 going to P3. So that's how it goes. So everything stored in the chain. So money is basically stored in the chain. Echoes as echoes all transactions in this chain using a mechanism called blockchain. So size of the blockchain is exponentially increased. So, so as I mentioned, since the, this creation of the blockchains happens in kind of distributed manner, so someone has to wait six blocks to be created before accept, finally accepting the transaction. So when you have a look on such blockchain a little bit in detail, it's like complex data structure like that. It has transaction content, address, which gives the transactions, private signature, and the public key which should use to verify the signature, and whatever the wallet private key is used to create this signature. 
the public key also included, and then signature include address and so on. Then address of the previous transaction will include in the next block and so on. It's like complicated block. So as I mentioned, how the money is created, so as a reward. So initially, Bitcoin gives 50 as a reward for the people who create a new block. Later on, it reduced to 25, and then it reduced to 12.5 Bitcoins. Nowadays, it's a reward value is 12.5 Bitcoins. So if you carry, carry on this system, so theoretically we can prove so number of bitcoins created in the world total is 21 million so it's a finite supply so in the physical currency you know we have infinite supply but in the cryptocurrency we have a finite supply maximum 21 million rate of creation in blocks so usually six blocks per hour so in order to kind of maintain this rate, so, so we will increase the difficulty of the problem every after four years. So we believe like uh, by 2140, so everybody will finish getting those numbers, case. So like, we, nowadays, we are exponentially creating those numbers and somewhat after it gets saturated. So somehow by like 2040, we have almost created all random case, find it out all random case. That means we have generated all the Bitcoins in the world. So that's why we have to assign the transaction fee. Because if there are no transaction fee to the miners, miners may not try to with the block. So then our transaction may not get validated. So now miners will do without even having transaction fee because they can get a reward. The reward value will decrease by every four years because of that. So in the future, people might, miners should us a fee to mine these transactions. So if you think about security of those transactions, so if someone want to hack it, Maybe he has to buy a huge computing power, has to change the transaction, and has to change all the values. So up to the present, so it means huge computer power. So to insert a legal lock into the chain. So no one will do that because if he has, let's assume someone has such power, so then for him it worth to creating a block rather than trying to cheat it. Because by creating the block, he can get rewards of the chain, so he can generate the money. By cheating, he might not be able to get that huge money. So as I said, this transaction, between transactions are pseudo-anonymous. That means if people create an address wallet without revealing, re revealing or without giving his real name, so no one will be able to find it out who are this person. If I create a wallet with my real name, then everybody knows this address belongs to the person. So if I create a wallet with someone else's name or without a name, everyone see that hash values or back 64 encoded hash values, then no one doesn't know who is owning this address. So that provides them. However, those transactions goes between these addresses. And then when you analyze the set of transactions and the way it passes in between, so the way you can identify clusters. You can identify clusters which exchange in those. So if one guy in the cluster, if you can somehow identify his identity, using that identity, there might be techniques we can trace back the other people in these clusters. So they are pseudo anonymous, but it's not so perfect. So later on, there is some other cryptocurrency systems created like zero coin, zero cash and so on, which provide better anonymity. But you know, the Bitcoin is the first cryptocurrency and still the most popular cryptocurrencies in the world. And Bitcoin mine is, mining is nowadays is a big business. There is a big Bitcoin 
whatever the mining farms, huge server farms are available, which create in those hash values because it's a big competition between the miners. So everybody, every mining company is trying to create a mine or try to create these blocks before the pre other companies. So to get those rewards. So mining become a big business nowadays. So in history, at the initially, maybe 10 years ago, so individual people also have some multi-coding processors to create these minings that now is impossible. So there are few miners which do this business. So then people are afraid if that miners, after this competition between miners, if that single miner is exist in the world, then we lost this beauty of decentralized application. So then, then it's Bitcoin might become then similar to a central or other coins which basically controlled by one single mind. So because of that, people usually try to manage or try to kind of establish as much as possible miners to make it more distributed. But if eventually if one miner get the ownership of all the miners, then we have to rethink about this design. Mining difficulty is kind of change over the time, as I said. So it should create a value less than some t. So it say count the less than t used by looking at the leading zeros. So so at the beginning it was four leading zeros. Now it's sixteen zeros. So we have to get a hash with sixteen zero bits at the beginning. And in order to get this hash, we have to change this k. So we have to find the hash by applying this k to our block. And we need to find the hash which in this pattern. So then we, we will win and we will get reward by the points. So then all the transactions in this block get validated. All the trust on the Bitcoin actually depend on the network and the protocol we discuss. It not, it not depend on any organization or the individual. So that is the beauty of the coin. It's not controlled by any government, any of us, even it's not controlled by the owner of this Bitcoin, creator of the Bitcoin. So there are no one owning the, this system. It is entirely owned by its users. So there are marketplaces where we can sell and buy bitcoins and we can check the present price of the bitcoins. I have created this slide a few months ago. <coughs> yeah, bitcoin price was at kind of $6,000. So as I said, it was in 20,000 and now dropped to 6,000 range. So this is about cryptocurrencies. There are some kind of other set of currencies in the world called as crypto token. I will not discuss that in the right now. Okay, let me compare props and cons of this Bitcoin with the regular currencies. So the advantage are Bitcoins are independent currency, little more transaction fee <coughs> compared to the credit card. Credit card take three percent Bitcoin. It's kind of zero percent right now. In the future, it might take one percent. And they are securely signed, encrypted. We don't need to have separate protocols such as TLS uh, to protect. Credit card need TLS, but Bitcoin protocol itself is secure, and they are right in the blockchain. No one can cheat. Security is well designed. The amount of transactions is unlimited. Any, any number of transactions, any amount can be done. It is kind of pseudonymous. <coughs> Bad side, unstable. The value started $1, went to $20,000, dropped to $6,000, and so on. Very unstable, volatile market. Still only few good merchants kind of genuine for the good market, uh, uh, the few marketplaces accept that. So, but, but all the underworld marketplaces, 
bad guys accept the bitcoins but still the acceptance of bitcoins among the good people is really less <laughs> okay. to transfer bitcoin no way to reverse it similar to cash anyway so i can compare this with the us dollars if you wish so for example let's take us dollars us dollar or any other currency basically backed by the government because of that it's controlled by the government countries and it be used within that geographical region and created by the government and the supply is entirely controlled by the politicians politicians so if you take a currency in the, some country the how many currencies get printed decided by the government in the power so they decide whether to print thousand of notes or not so it's controlled by the governments and not by the people so when you come to the bitcoin there are no country get involved it's backed by their users controlled by the users and it is international no geographical boundaries and created by also the users and there is a limited supply there are no infinite set of supplies but in the regular currencies no upper limit but cryptocurrencies always there are supplies and when you take regular currencies easy to steal by muggers and hard to steal by hackers because it's a physically person currency but in take the bitcoin hard to steal by muggers because muggers may not see that but it easy to steal by hackers actually the network blockchain itself cannot hack but hackers can hack your wallet the most big point is your wallet for if someone hack your wallet and take it out you taking out your private key he has taken out your bitcoins associated with that private key that's why people are maintaining maintaining different wallets and different pair of private public keys with different bitcoins so when you take hard currency it's very hard to transmit through the wire but in bitcoin it is easy to transmit over the wire in both currencies they are providing anonymity to some extent so hard to trace and both when you pay hard currency or the cryptocurrency it's not non refundable we cannot give the money and tell that not is money we cannot get it back it's, it's gone it's gone and in the last point is very important that is the point always against cryptocurrency people claim cryptocurrencies used by crime used by criminals so that is correct at present because most of the criminals use cryptocurrencies right now only few good guys you see that is correct so that is the negative point always highlighted by the people against cryptocurrencies but you think about carefully dollar like real currency started thousands years ago and from the history to right now those hard currencies also used by crime for use for crimes used by criminals no? so criminals are shifted from real currencies to cryptocurrencies because they see that advantage now the time to shift good people also to the cryptocurrencies so the cryptocurrency is not designed for crime it's designed for everyone but the criminals are the people who see the advantage of this so that's what happened right now but in the future real people may also understand that advantage of the coins challenges right now we have with the cryptocurrencies the currencies are too young so as i repeatedly say storage of these currencies wallets are insecure we need to find the methods to protect these cryptocurrency wallets otherwise hackers may hack into our wallets and steal our cryptocurrencies and then uh the government will face a lot of difficulties in the future if they don't carefully look at this cryptocurrency schemes because if people start using cryptocurrencies how to take the tax how to trace them how to stop illegal trades 
So those things, the government have to carefully look at. No solutions right now. They are the challenges, to the, especially to the governments. Cryptocurrency is forced big challenge. So I had a very long session. So if you want to st uh, study further, I have given some references. You can read those as a final word, distributed currencies or cryptocurrencies. So people think, says it is for bad guys, that is wrong. The cryptocurrency is for good guys, plus bad guys. So people say it's for bad guys because it's heavily used for crimes right now. And bad guys use kind of ransom, collect ransoms, things like that using cryptocurrencies. Like there is ransomware, so a lot of bad people using cryptocurrencies. That's why people say cryptocurrency is for bad guys. So the underworld e-commerce, that is wrong. Cryptocurrencies can be used by good guys as well. So in, 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 a, in a way, government is also banned, right? Because government also take out, takes tax. So that is kind of ransom, right? So then government take tax using hard currency and say don't use cryptocurrency because it's bad guys might take ransom if you start using cryptocurrency. So government would like to use, governments would like to see people use hard currency because they can take taxes out of that. So that is also bad, right? Isn't it? With that, I will conclude that session. Thank you very much for listening these sessions uh, to so far towards the end. Thank you.